instead of just sitting down and doing the Thank big you. camera interview, to do something with them, to film and have an experiential kind of documentary where we see them in their element doing their thing. So I just got back from Tampa, was that February? It was already pretty down there. Yeah. Yeah, so I went down to visit with Mark and shot with him while he was working on some final line art for some of the characters you see up here. I've gone to film with Ron Rudad, I've filmed with Bill Merkline, the sculptor, Kirk Bazigi and the brand manager, and basically uh, we're getting all the behind the scenes process documented. This will be the best documented toy line you ever own, I guarantee that. <laughs> um, if you go over to that table, you'll see portfolios for every figure. You'll see it from ideation sketches to refined drawings to presentation art we'll end up with, that's what he's doing next to package paintings, uh, thumbnail sketches with packaging mock-ups done by Ed Morrill, who was the packaging uh, contractor. He's an executive from 1969 to 1989. He rebranded the adventure team, hired and managed Don Stivers, the paintings, the painter on those 12-inch figures. He hired Hector Garrido, managed him, gave him thumbnail sketches to route a real American hero up through 89. Uh, he branded G.I. Joe a real American hero, did the logo, the stars and bars, the stripes, all that was Siegel, uh, CLS and M, Coleman, Lacuma, Siegel, and Moore. So Ed Moore is the man, he's doing our packaging for us. I'm working with him and his son to do, to create this logo that was uh, Sean Morrill uh, in partnership with Ed Morrill. So we've got the old team back together. I'm gonna shoot through a slide deck that I stayed up until three working on, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it really quickly, guys. All right, here we go. Nice so unfortunately my remote was working for an earlier panel, now it's not working so I have to be up here for this. So I'm gonna try to shoot through it. Started with the books, that's cool. Now let's do a hardcover, okay, that's great. We gotta shoot some new interviews, great. But sit down interviews are boring, so let's do something experiential. Let's make a new figure together. So that's how Rotello started. This little guy right here, it, it sprung from doing those video interviews. So we got Ron Rudat, the original figure designer. For those that don't know, Mark Pennington followed Ron Rudat. In 1986 they overlapped <coughs> And they basically teamed up on all the 1987 figures together. It was kind of like a hot potato, right, Mark? Ron just tossed them to you? Yeah, Ron, Ron I guess, was probably just a little bit burnt out because he yeah. did done so many jokes. He'd done 150 so figures. So he had designed stuff, and I just kind of got thrown into the loop and picked up where he left off. Because some stuff was designed, some stuff was half designed, and then I just kind of picked up. Them. And accessory drawings, yeah. sculpt sheets, all that stuff. So Ron had done a lot of the ideation for 87, but he hadn't finished, and there's a lot more steps along the way. So anyway, we got Ron Rudat to do figure design. There he is doing presentation artwork for Rotello. We got Kirk Bazigian to review, and Kirk is really good with a red pen. He marks up, he marks up everything. No, really, he's an idea guy, and he brings a lot of value to every toy. He's always thinking, how can we make it more fun, more engaging? He had kids of his own. When he came back on G.I. Joe in 1990, he said every toy needed to do something. It needs to be fun. And so he's really good at bringing ideas into that. I filmed the whole thing. Uh, Ed Morrill's the packaging executive I was telling you about. He did the packaging sketches for Rotello. You can see the final card art up here. Uh, we filmed with him talking through his process of how he designed, how he decided how to pose, which accessories to feature in the foreground, that kind of thing. Uh, Doug Hart, the packaging illustrator, started at Hasbro in 1984, started on G.I. Joe in 1987, became the main G.I. Joe painter around 1990. Uh, we did find out Hector Garrido stayed on contract all the way through 1994, so a lot of that work up through 94 is still Garrido. But Doug Hart was doing the lion's share by that point, so I went and filmed with him. Bill Merkline's the sculptor. He did 70 G.I. Joe sculpts back in the 80s. This is well documented on 3D Joe's if you go into pre-production and then creator profiles. My big mission on 3D Joe's now is interviewing these guys and putting their information out there for everybody to know all their contributions to the brand we love. And then getting them to make new figures for us. It just organically grows, man. All right, so there's Bill. Uh, Larry wrote all the dossiers, all the file cards for these guys, and I'm still trying to twist his arm into doing a comic. If you guys could dutch him and say, do a recall comic, that'd be great, thank you. All right, so do, I'm gonna shoot through Rotella really quick. We did drawings, loose drawings, all these concepts for the carrier pigeon, backpack. Kirk used his red pen. Uh, Ron revised all the designs, and he did color studies, and then we selected one. Kirk used his red pen again. Uh, we did the presentation artwork. We did 3D modeled and printed accessories. These are all resin printed. All the prototypes that you see back there, I'm actually printing them at my house using a Form 3 uh, 3D printer. I'm working with Mark. He's doing all the 3D modeling. So this is the expert in that area. And what I'm doing is bringing in people with expertise, playing to everybody's strengths, and trying to form the dream team and make the best products we can for you guys. So this is uh, Doug Hart's process for his painting. Just a few steps there. 
ended up with an amazing painting. This is Bill Merklon's process. You can see he, had, he did the muscles first and then the clothing and then the straps and then the grenades. Like you can see it's layer by layer using plumber seal epoxy on this naked uh, armature. You'll see all of the armatures for figures eight through 17 back there. They're all ready. The other seven are actually at Bill Merklein's house and Mike Good's house, and they're in progress, and I've got photos to show you guys. So this is where we ended up with Rotello on the sculpt. That's his desk. I literally lived at his house for two weeks. I think this was like two years ago now, and he's a good friend. Um, he's an amazing guy. We watched all kinds of great movies. We talked politics. And it was fun. So everybody was sad when it was done, though. So I said, well, it doesn't have to be done. I've got like 8,000 email subscribers from 3D Joe's, and every book I put out there, you guys have been so great about supporting me. Thank you. Um, but so I said to the team, well, let's see how many of these they'll pay for. Because I paid for Rotello out of pocket. It was like 17 grand, and that was just me just wanting to do it. Honestly, it was going to be a chapter in my book. That's Most all. Most expensive figure ever. <laughs> <laughs> for a collector. I mean, who of you have paid 17 grand for a figure? It was, it was a crazy passion project. And for me, it was going to be one chapter in my book, The Art of G.I. Joe. But it grew into such a bigger idea. And when we got done, literally every one of them was like, kind of sucks, this is over. That was fun. And so we, uh, we decided to go ahead and finish the figure. That's Bill's sculpt. That's a copy, a resin copy made off of a mold. And then that's a paint master by Matthew LaCroix. So we had to finish the figure up to show it to you guys, to show you how amazing their work is still to this day. And so there's Rotello, all geared up. I got with Ed Morrill and his son, Sean, and we did a branding exploration. And we ended up with our packaging for Operation Recall. And there's our brand. So then we put together a website. We showed everybody the creative team. And we did a call for submissions. So what I haven't told you guys, and most of you probably already know, Rotello was an idea I had when I was a 10-year-old. Rotello was somebody I submitted to Hasbro in 1989. So that's my cover letter, my file card, and those are my little drawings showing which parts they could re reuse, like use old molds, and which new parts they would have to sell. Yeah. I was trying to save money so they would make my figures. <laughs> they didn't make my figures. So here we are, 40 years later, making my figures. Uh, anyway, I don't take no for an answer. So uh, we got 270 submissions, and we all got together for two days. This was the Operation Recall Summit. And so this is where Mark Pennington joined the team, because obviously Ron Rudak did the first figure design. But I said, no, nah, we're going to scale this team out. We're going to do a whole line. And so that's when Mark came on. And so we went through for two days and looked at all 270 concepts and just really brainstormed not only which ones did we want to do, but which ones would work together, which ones would flesh out like a whole team. And so from there, we came out with our top 16. And you can see them on the back of the cross cell. We're also going to feature the creators that work on each figure. So you see those silhouettes for the figures up top, and then you see the credits for everybody that touched the figure at the bottom. So I think that's a really cool innovation. So these are the figures. This is what we announced last year was the selections, and that was a lot of fun because some of the people were here. Uh, and then, so these are these are our guys. I don't know why it's uh, you got. Oh well, Breacher, he's the door kicker. Cadavers, he's the one that li could live next to you like a crimson guard, but he's got this suit in his closet, and if he gets the assignment to come in and slit your throat, he's gonna do that tonight. It's gonna be really scary. So that's Cadavers. Damselfly builds her own jetpacks and rocket, uh, you know, weaponry and that kind of thing. She's super high tech, but unfortunately, she's a bad girl. Uh, then you have Soul Eagle Guerrero, amazing luchador soldier. David, where are you at? David, this is such an awesome concept. I love it. Uh, he's got a championship belt that he wears in yeah. the battle. He's just, and, and the way Larry wrote the foul card, he's super boisterous. It's like everybody loves having his support on the battlefield, but when the battle's over, they don't all love his like glory hogging. You know? <laughs> he's still got that performance aspect to him. This is an amazing costume. This figure design probably changed the least because that design, that costume is just incredible. So Chris is, uh, Chris is gonna be immortalized in plastic for this one. Shh is our ninja. This was pitched by, how old were you when you actually created this idea? 10? Yeah, so 10 year old me didn't get my way, but 10 year old him is getting his way. <laughs> Pretty cool, right? So we've got uh, his robotic leg back there that you can see. Mark put that together, I printed it. So it's all a team effort, man, it's so cool. Bear Claw, uh, Gabriel's here from overseas. He extended his trip so he could be here for the panel. That's really awesome. <laughs> Uh, Clanker and Tank. So this was kind of based on a battle android trooper. We couldn't really do a battle android trooper. Hasbro already made those, and you could buy those, right? But we love this idea of this guy that uh, cobbled together his costume, and then also is like a nature lover, and befriended a giant Galapagos tortoise, 
So it was just a really cool story, man. So we just had we had to roll with it, but we modified the figure quite a bit. So you'll see Clanker and Tank over there. Great Whites evolved a lot too. Kirk wanted him to be more of a speedy demon of the deep kind of guy instead of a you know kind of deep sea diver kind of guy. So you're all about speed, streamlined. You'll see him over there with a jet pack with a fin on the on the jet pack that makes him look like a shark. Mark just gave me color studies today where uh, it's like an orco where it's white on the bottom and black on the back. It's so tight, man. There, I, every time something comes in from Mark and Ron, I'm like a kid in the candy store. I cannot believe this is my life, that I get to work with these guys and make new figures. I can't say that enough. It's incredible. Bengal is an Indian intelligence sniper. She's going to have a really big case to hold her weapon. Uh, she's going to have a cloth sari that gives some color to her. And Ron made her sexy. It's, it's awesome. Run back. Oh, uh, we'll talk about the figures here in a little bit. Run back is a Japanese technologist, so she's an expert. She's uh, working with kind of those Boston Dynamics robot dogs. This is going to be a modular design, so the, the robot dog changed quite a bit. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But Mark uh, is our 3D modeler and 3D designer. He is leading some of he's I'd say on the tip of the spear in the community with GI Joe in 3D modeling and design. We're gonna open this up, open source to the community, to give you guys the footprint that that robot dog is gonna feature, and you're gonna be able to design, print, and make your own accessories. If it's ammo, if it's rations, if it's medical supplies, if it's Gatling guns, whatever you want it to be. And we're probably gonna sell like five packs of pack dogs, so you can just build out your robot dog army with whatever 3D printed, and we're gonna give everybody permission to make and sell their own stuff, just have at it, man. We want it to be open and fun for everybody. Crates that come with the supply chain guy, for example, are going to peg into that robot dog because he's a quartermaster and she's her, she's his protege, basically. So he's the older kind of gristle guy from North Carolina, and she's the young Japanese. Uh, she's kind of on loan to the U.S. right now. Night Raid is like a kind of burned out old mercenary. He used to be Russian. He actually uh, turned uh, a while back, and he's been fighting in Ukraine lately. Um, we don't have a whole lot of real world military ties. We want this line to be fun. But that was one thing. This was the story that was kind of pitched to me from Johnny Russell, and I love it. The fact that we're going to represent a kind of aged out, overweight, mercenary type guy. He's a little portly. Go look at the, the 360 turnaround drawings of him. I think it's really cool to get different representation throughout this line. We'll talk more about the buck size variation here in a little bit. Lilith is our paratrooper girl with a scar on her chin and a bad attitude. Um, Alpha Dog is a Navy CB. So now it's time to get to work. Mark, what have you been doing last nine months? Getting to work. Getting to work. Getting to work. Uh, am I easy to work with? Uh, okay, I should have put him on the spot like that. The other one, another, I'm the one that's really into work. Yeah, that's true. He's, he's the most pleasant guy to work with. Literally, honestly, if I didn't like Ron and Mark and Doug and everybody that's worked on this, I get along well with all of them. I literally do. Haven't, haven't met like a kind of like huge ego yet. So this is the uh, process. I'm only going to do this for one figure because literally we would fill the rest of Joe Fest. This is the most fun for all 19 figures. This is where Mark really gets in on it. So Mark, if you want to kind of take the helm on this, uh, if, if, I don't want to put you on the spot too bad, but I also don't want to talk about John. Well, I, I just kind of start, I'd like to start, we had we had the initial ideas. So then my, I, my um, concept to do this stuff, or my idea to do this, was to do one initially as close to the original as possible, then do a couple that I liked, then do a couple that I think are insane or crazy, and then do one more just for fun of it. Because I, I, what, what I was explaining to Carson and some of the other guys, I like to do try as hard as I can on the first couple, and then do some silly ones and some stuff that I think that nobody would like, because we, and, and that I think are stupid, 
but because you always get something out of it. You know, like I said, you don't know what you want until you know what you don't want. But you always get a belt or a scarf or something, something out of these silly ones that I do. Something always comes out. The same with the color. When I did the color sketches, I do some really cool ones and really Joe ones. And do some silly ones. And like I said, some of the silly ones, I'm like, oh, I kind of like that. <laughs> you know, so, but anyway, I like to start with silhouettes. And I, if you can see, I stay loose. I don't really try too hard. I just want to have fun. I, uh, I start off scribbling, basically. I kind of scribble a figure in. And, and just basically go from there. Like, if you kind of had all this gun, then go, what do you want? Well, I'm like, what's wrong with it? You know, I'm like, well, I remember Blackbeard the Pirate. Blackbeard used to carry dozens of pistols. You know, and then he also, one of my favorite things about Blackbeard, I don't know if you guys know this, he um, was scary, he's a big guy, that big beard, he tied candles into his beard that smoked. So that's why he carried dozens of guns. Light it, fire it, light it, fire it, light it, fire it, so he could light it. And then plus it made him scary. All that smoke building off of the heat, where the ship with his cutlass and, you know, got 12 guns on him, stuff like that. So that was, you know, I see that night. I love history and I love that joke, so that's immediately what I think of what? It has nothing to do with pirates. But, you know, that, that's why I tried to put it in. I had to put, what, 10, 15 guns up there? Yeah, <laughs> no So, <laughs> that kind of thing. And, and then again, a lot of it's taken from them, and I just started kind of looking off and adding pads and, you know, doing stuff. I mean, so this is what we call the ideation phase, where he's just throwing everything in the wall and seeing what sticks. And so when we get done with that, that's when I have my sit-down review with Kirk Pizigian, uh Joe Goldston that's here, uh, joined us for several of those meetings as well. And uh, we go through kind of picking and shooting. This is the hard part, man, really, because they've given us a bunch of good ideas to work with, and you have to narrow it. You can't do them all. So we ended up marking everything up, and then I would transcribe the notes into one little kind of kickoff letter for the guys. So I'm basically like a project manager on this. Um, so then I went in very detailed and said, okay, with the head, let's keep the goatee, let's do whatever, let's do whatever, and give them detailed feedback, along with photocopies of all the drawings they submitted with everything marked up like they used to do back in the day. So you can see those marked up drawings in the portfolios. Those are going to be here all weekend, so come and go at your leisure and have a look through them, because next year they won't be here. Those portfolios are going to be sent off to backers that bought them, right? So. Um, this shows you as Mark dug in onto his uh, his refined kind of final line art for the figure. You want to talk about? When I do these, now when I do the concept stuff, I try to do some kind of action colors because I'm trying to get a flavor for the guy. Right? I'm trying to get some personality. And again, when I do the final illustration, I'll do the same thing. I'll pick an action pose, maybe some background or something, just just to give the guy some character. You know, like I said, get his personality. But when I do this. I want you to be able to see him. I want you to, you know, if he's got something on this side, you, you want them to be able to see every detail, and in that way, there's no there's no messing up when I go to the sculpture sheets. I know exactly what the front looks like. You know, I know exactly kind of what the back looks like. Looks like. So this is pretty much just so that I know where everything's at, and they can look at it and go, well, that gun needs to be here, or, or maybe can we change this? But if not, then we approve it, then Yep. So we uh, we don't have his color studies scanned yet to show, but we will show you the engineering drawings. So this is what we use. This is what we send to Bill Markline and Mark and Mike Good to get them sculpting on those bucks that are back there. So we've got uh, seven of those in progress. This is a, basically a 360 view of Breacher. These are the engineering drawings for the accessories for Breacher. Um, Mark will actually literally take these into Autodesk Fusion and build specifically around these. I didn't get a chance to pull your photo thing because I've been running out of panels, but you want to talk about the process of using these, bringing yeah, in the drums? Sure, sure. It's, a, it's been, it's been kind of interesting because if, you, if you've seen what I've been doing, um, I, I've primarily been sticking to kind of real world weapon. And the the Caltech's Cal great, they're trying, trying to make that sort of a real weapon system. system. And Carson has shown me the, the, um, the picture, some of the sound picture of that all the days. It's, yep. it's yep. really big. And there's prototypes on that back desk, so you can see these weapons today. Uh, but, but like, like uh, now I get to take sketches from Mark and Ron of weapon systems, systems that don't exist in the real world, world and, and flush it out and create a, a real world physical thing out of that. Plus, plus the cool thing, I don't know if you do this, but when we worked at Hasbro, the guys are doing the weapons, that had extra little bolts here. Yeah, you know, yeah, especially yeah. on the base. Right. You know, that, that 
they put their own little flavor and stuff on it. And they'd always come back and go, is this okay? I'm like, I do what the hell you want. I don't care. <laughs> Get the general shape right, and, and you can add all you want. But it's so, been weird for me because it's like, I, I, I've, I've got, got these guys, guys giving me artwork, and uh, it's like, do I have the, the right to, to wiggle things around? And, and, and <laughs> they're like, they're like yeah. So, yeah, we, we want every artist to leave their fingerprint on this. I think everybody can contribute contribute creatively to it. A little bit of input helps. I mean, part of extra details. I mean, that's what Joe's all about. Yeah. Extra little details here and here, extra little faces. So, so we only got one pistol on the belt. We really toned yeah. that down, but we did get one. <laughs> and, and back in the day, they would put pistols on the cross pieces, but they were usually, you could barely make it out. It was a little blob. It had to release from the mold, and so that kind of aesthetically hampered what you could do. So this will actually be a pistol that pegs in to the crotch area so that it looks like a real pistol in there. This is the giant China Lake grenade launcher. We're actually probably gonna make that about 20% smaller. And then this is the kel KSG shotgun. So the clear figures back there are just props to show off the gray weapons, right? The gray bucks that are down below are the ones that are gonna go to the sculptors and be sculpted. This is a basically a free up, I would say, of Damselfly's jetpack that Mark built. This is literally my first print off the Form Labs Form 3 printer. And look at that, it's functional. She's gonna have this little jetpack. It's awesome, man. So have a look at the accessories that they have back there. Get a sense of their work. Yep, exactly. So Targat, he designed, and it was intended to have a much larger jetpack that Targat could roll over and fall in through the atmosphere and burn in using spaceship panels on that jetpack, and then they cost reduced it down to this tiny jetpack. If you look at the- It got rid of the idea. Too. Yeah, it, it blew up the concept. He had a really cool concept and the, the accessory didn't deliver. Do you have time to tell them? Yeah, sure. My concept was there would be thousands of these guys hovering in space, and they have their spacesuits and they have their packs. So when they pick their target, they can be anywhere in the world, you know, within a few minutes. And once they pick their target, they all just flip over. And you remember when, NASA was doing the panels, and they had to test all those thick panels. So I had all those panels on the back of their ship, or on the back of their backpacks, and when they flipped over, uh, they would burn in, flip back over, then the wings would pop open, and then they could glide into, so they had thousands of them. That was my idea. Because I'm like, how cool would that be to get flipped over? Shh, all burn in, and flip back over. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> If they wrote that into the comic, I think we would all love Targat way more. <laughs> <laughs> right. Tell Larry. So there's the uh, Special Operations Warrior Dog. Um, I actually went to the Airborne Special Ops Museum in Fort Bragg and uh, took a bunch of photos of that dog, sent them to Mark. So that's another kind of like art direction fun that I get to have. You know, we're always looking for inspiration everywhere. There's Mark toiling away the last six months on Operation Recall. We filmed with him some as well. All right, so then we got into the sculpture kickoff. I would send these letters to Bill Murphine and Mike Good, and they're, again, detailed. Looking, you know, the more detail you can give them, the higher your probability of getting back what you intended. So uh, I also sent along the dossiers by Larry so the sculptors knew like who these people were. Um, I would send them these drawings, the engineering drawings that Mark Pennington sent me. But he doesn't have a machine gun, so he doesn't need a banana clip like that, right, on the dog. So we would still be making modifications along the way like that. Um, he does have a 40 millimeter China Lake grenade launcher that Larry called for. So we gave him the 40 millimeter round photos and uh, 12 gauge shotgun shell belts for the kel KSG. We're making sure that the figure has details that match the accessories. Their ammo loadout should match the weaponry that they're carrying. Um, so we're, I'm worried about details like that, and I'm giving stuff like this to the sculptors to make sure they get it right. Um, here's some sculpture updates. We started with all of these. This is a high temperature <coughs> resin from Form Labs that could hold up to the crock pot that Bill Merkline sticks his uh, figures in. He's just plumber seal epoxy. You mix it together, that makes it start to harden, but then you put it in a crock pot to accelerate and lock in that sculpt. When he feels good, like with the clothing, and he's ready to start on the belts, then you'll bake the clothing so it's, it's done, it's cooked in. You can still sand it at that point, but you're not really gonna scrape away at it. So uh, we started out with all these figures. I basically printed all the bucks, and then we decided that material was too brittle, and I threw them all away <laughs> and started over. Um, we decided with the bucks that we were gonna make different scales, because this is something that they wanted to do back in the day that engineering would never let them do. And I, I want to- 
except for Roken, he did get a big torso. Mm -hmm. I wanted to give these guys the chance to do what they wanted to do back in the day, and engineering, engineering told them no. I wanted to tell them yes. So there are a few, you know, innovations that we're doing that kind of step it beyond what they did with Real American Hero, but the joints are still compatible. The shoulders, the hips, it's all still compatible. All right, but you do have different scales. Um, that's just him saying hello. This is a little thing I invented to hold the buck together. Now these are, this is an example of a few different buck sizes. So you have the standard female on the left, standard male in the middle, and the wide shouldered but standard height male right there. So Breacher and Hellhound, this is a sculpt update. This is a three part dog, left half, right half, and head. The head will swivel, there'll be a collar there. Bill is a dog guy, so he jumped in on the dog first. Uh, that's Bill's dog, Puck, on the right. Those are my two dogs on the left. We hang out. Um, so then he got in on the figure, and then he finished the dog. Well, this is not finished yet. This is when I visited. The figure was pretty close to done. The dog was not. And then he sent photos of the dog almost finished. The dog is looking amazing. That's Hellhound, by the way. All right, and then Mark was working on the accessories, and I started printing those up. So this shows off the swivel wrist functionality. You can hold the KSG pump accurately using the swivel wrist, which is a really cool innovation. That's an example of Breacher, uh, Breacher's loadout, but the China Lake with the handle, we're not using that. So this is an example of me and Mark trying a couple things and deciding what we wanted. We tried it with the handle, we tried it without, we're going without. Um, here's a cadaver sculpt update. Look at that sculpt, man. That sculpt is incredible. You are not gonna accomplish this digitally. There's a humanity and a, a variance to hand sculpted stuff that there's not to digital. You know, most people would sculpt that punch dagger on the left breast in digital, and then they would copy it, and they would paste it on the other side, you know, and they would do the same thing with pouches and pockets and all that kind of stuff. You don't have the, the handcrafted artisanal feel with digitally sculpted stuff. It's, I think it's really great for the hard goods, for doing the bucks and doing the weapons and that kind of thing, but anything that's human, that's fleshy, that's cloth, I just think it looks better analog. So I'm a, I'm a big advocate for doing it this way. And not many people are doing it this way. Well, the hard rule of thumb is mechanical stuff use mechanical tools, organic stuff use yes. organic. Yes, it, it just has more humanity to it, you know? So anyway, the accessories, of course, we're doing 3D design, and again, Mark is taking their drawings into Autodesk Fusion and staying very faithful to, you know, that's Mark Pennington's drawings there, basically translated into a 3D. And that works. Both swords pull out, the swords connect together at the hilt, um, so we've got some play functionality there. That's a little communications headpiece on his head. The grenade came out nice. The grenade did, yep. Mark's doing a great job with this. So there's the swords pulled out and plugged together. And there's his loadout. All right, Soul Eagle, here's a sculpt. Here's a little sculpt update for him. He's a jolly fellow. So he's our big, kind of boisterous guy, right? So, you know, Bill knew that, so Bill gave him a lot of personality. He's, he thinks he's sexy. <laughs> Damselfly, he's just getting started on her, so she doesn't have hair. She looks kind of scary without the hair, but he's working on her. And then, shh. One of the most important features of shh is the prosthetic leg, obviously. Uh, it's really cool to have that kind of inclusion in here. There's a lot of military guys. I'm from Southern Pines, right next to Fort Bragg. We have eight times as many wounded now as we did back during like Vietnam, for example. So while the Vietnam numbers are a lot bigger, we lost a lot more guys back then. We have a ton of guys coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan that have significant wounds. And since they weren't deep in the jungle, they were close to medical support. Let's just be honest, a lot of people live through stuff now that they wouldn't have lived through back then. So I think this is really important. And when I saw Alexander's pitch for a ninja with a robotic leg, I was like, heck yes, let's do it. The, the leg is silent, by the way, because he's a silent ninja. So I'm not sure what kind of hydraulics he has in there, but it, it works well. Those are all the accessories. What did you say, Alex? He just greases it a bunch. Um, there actually is hydraulics on the back of the heel. Uh, you can't see it in the photo we took, but the leg's over there, you can look at it. So on the back of the leg, there's hydraulics on the heel. It's just really cool design work. Um, these accessories are all available to look at over there. And there's the sculpt. He looks incredible. This is my good putting in work. So Bill Merkline got so reputable at Hasbro, they started to be able to recommend his friends. Mike Good was somebody he brought, brought in back in the 80s, and now Mike Good is somebody he's brought back in in 2023, so really cool. I'm gonna go visit him, he's north of San Diego, and I'm gonna film with him too, of course. Um, this is a kickoff packet for Bear Claw. Mike Good's working on Bear Claw right now, and here's a sculpt done. This is a partial, 
So this is only the torso, the hips, the head, and one boot is finished, right? This is an in-progress photo. But look at that facial expression. You see the little bear claw necklace too? Yeah, just the details here, man. He's, he's doing amazing work. So that's the sculpt update. I'm just gonna shoot through these color studies. What time do we have, guys? 10 till, which means we got 10 more minutes. No, 15. All right, I'm just gonna shoot through these color studies. I was gonna have you guys vote on them, but that's probably a bridge too far. All right, so damsel fly. Soul eagle. This is called Dark Reapers now. It used to be Los Castigadores. Uh, Larry reserves the right to change any and all names. He's Dark Reapers now. I'm digging the one on the left. Anyway, we're all going to have our favorites. This is where Kirk Bazigian comes into play. He gets to pull out his red pin and, you know, pick and choose. All right, so uh, this is Bingle. I think the Sari needs to be colorful, though, so I'm going to advocate pretty hard for number five or number six on the Sari. Night Raid, this is our portly mercenary. He's got, that's a real gun. It's a scorpion backpack uh, made by the Russians, a heavy rate of fire. That's an NSB machine gun uh, that was manufactured by the Russians. So he's using Russian weaponry to kill Russians right now, which is pretty cool. Um, this is Lilith. She's our parachuter. Now, Ron, uh, Ron did 12 of these, I think. Yeah, he just went to town on Lilith. You know, gave us different ethnicity options, obviously a bunch of different color schemes, tons of options there. This is our CB, our Navy construction mechanic, so we've got the big wrench on the back, salty dog. All right. So I just hope, you know, you guys stick with us because all this stuff's coming to life. And I really, I've been working on the Art of G.I. Joe Omnibus hardcover, if you guys don't know about that, 712 pages. And it has swallowed me whole for the last year while I've been keeping this going with these guys. So community, stick with us. We're going to make awesome stuff, and we're going to tell the story. So um, any questions for our esteemed guest, Mark Kennington, Mark Jerwig? What's been the most fun design to go through? which one was the most fun, but just doing the concept stuff was always the most fun. And I really don't care, you know, what the figure details, I don't care what the theme is or whatever. Just doing the concept stuff and the loose markers and just spitting out ideas, that, that's the most fun. For me, it's, um, the, the weapon I did that was the most abstract is uh, the animal flies kind of rocket gun. <laughs> It's a very unique design, and uh, it's a lot of fun to work on. I lied about throwing away the books. Somebody told me not to throw them away and to bring them to Joe Fest. So I'm literally just going to pass this around. You might think this is trash, or you might think this is a priceless artifact. So take a small handful, just like a couple pieces each, and pass it along. And you got a little bit of recall to take home with you. <laughs> 